to the LPE Author Chat Series. This is your host, Kimberly K. LaBoo. This is an into, impromptu pop-up publishing chat that we're doing this evening. You know, you can get real creative when you're on lockdown. <laughs> so today I have with me Kwanzaa Gibson. Kwanzaa is the owner of First Fruits Publishing, and she is joining me for this special pop-up publishing chat and we are going to share with you today 10 tips for writers. So I'm just so excited to be on here with you Kwanzaa. Um, welcome first. Awesome. Yes, always. I don't know what What's my, wrong? it seemed like my computer was, you know, I always have technical difficulties. <laughs> I think everybody's having technical difficulties <laughs> right now because everybody's trying to be technical. Exactly. <laughs> can you see me? Can you can see, see me when you're in? I can. Okay, because I still can't see you, but we're going to work this bring, thing out. But can you see me on Facebook, though? I can, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi, Gia. Hi, Tammy. So folks are popping in. Thank you guys for joining us. This is um, truly a pop-up session because we just started this. <laughs> so this all stemmed from my question that I posted on Facebook where I asked um, how many errors, I asked for avid readers to tell me how many errors was acceptable in a novel before they started getting annoyed. <laughs> And that question stemmed from a novel that I had just finished reading um, this morning or yesterday. I don't remember when I finished now, losing track of time. But, um, and, and it had like 14 errors in it. And I was like, am I the only one who gets annoyed by this? So I posed the question. And a lot of the responses were very interesting. <laughs> but then Kwanzaa popped in <laughs> and told me that she thought that 14 errors wasn't so bad. <laughs> In a, in a, like a 300 page now, I was like, okay, well, this was 207. What you got? <laughs> right, exactly. And it's funny because I was kind of doing the deductions, like, uh, you're right uh -huh. here on a tip, but 207 pages is a lot. It I, is. I know, it is. <laughs> I'm like the comma queen. So <laughs> if you're counting commas, then I'll, I'll probably hit that, you know, hit that 14 threshold real quick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so I was like, okay, so since Kwanzaa said it, you know, I, I, Kwanzaa's like my trusted publisher girlfriend, and I was like, well, maybe I need to be extending a little more grace. Yes, <laughs> so, thank you to Miss Gia. Know, yeah, Gia too. Yes. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't know if I can get to, to 14 era grace, but maybe, you know, maybe I can get to like five era grace from my three yeah. era grace. Like, yes. It's, it's just one of my peeves because at that point I start losing interest and, right. um, and pulling out my highlighter and all that kind of crazy stuff. But we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So, so Kwanzaa and I, so Kwanzaa really had the idea for us to collaborate and come up with this top 10 list to share with writers. Um, and Kimberly, if I, if I can say, Kimberly being as proficient as she is, she's like, how about five o'clock a day? It's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yes, yes. Why wait? Like, we got exactly. nothing to talk right now. <laughs> Look, and I like the fact that we both have on our author gear. Yeah. You have one that says Authors Rock, and mine says About That Writer Life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifestyle, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> it is a lifestyle. It is yeah. a lifestyle. Yes. So, so we wanted to, you know, give this top 10 list to hopefully be of value to people who are in the writing process or considering writing, just things that may be helpful for you along the way as you, you know, start to write your books or finish your books or what have you. So, Kwanzaa, you want to start it off? Um, so we're just going to just jump right in? <laughs> so unless you have something you want to share up front as a precursor to the top 10. Um, the only thing I would say is, honestly, everybody, no matter what area of business you're in, um, everybody needs a, a colleague or someone in that same industry who will continue to inspire and motivate you. And Kimberly has certainly been that for me in publishing. Just, you know, when I kind of took a step back, I just watched her just kind of mm -hmm. flourish uh, with her publishing. So that's been exciting, just watching all the things that she's doing. But it really has inspired me 
to continue to kind of press and, you know, kind of get back in there as well. So uh, whatever industry you're in, make sure you have someone that's in an industry as well who can kind of, you know, support you in, in, in all your endeavors. So without further ado, I guess I'll go with my first. Okay. Uh, my first thing on the list. And you know me, I always have to say something and then I have to add some commentary. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, we're both going to do that. Okay. So we're just going to do a straight tip. So it's probably like going to be quite a comical little show. So I think so. Right. <laughs> All right. So my first one is, um, and this is one of my pet peeves, is mm -hmm. don't imitate others. Um, know your style and know your voice. I think I said that when we did the last writer's or um, author's chat, but it's like mm -hmm. know your style, know your voice. I think it's okay to quote other people in your book and kind of, you know, spin off of what you've gotten from there. But when you get to the point where like 50 plus percent of your manuscript is quoted, no matter what it is from somewhere else or someone else, you kind of lose your voice a little bit in that. So that's my first uh, advice to um, up and coming authors or up and coming writers mm -hmm. is to know your style, know your voice and, uh, and, and be careful not to mimic other writers too much. So what if people like, like don't understand what you mean by knowing your voice and knowing your style? Like how does somebody figure that out? I think just your voice is your voice. However it sounds in your head, like me, I use um a lot, which isn't is like one of those big no-nos for speakers. And um, so in my in my head, I hear my voice and my rhythm and my tone, and I write to that, whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction. Um not well fiction is a little bit different because you're creating characters but right. understanding like just my style and my tone of my writing there's like a rhythm to writing and that yeah. rhythm is consistent to your tone and so when you're reading your stuff and it doesn't even sound like you you don't even recognize your voice in that so i guess to take a step back write how you say it or how you hear it and then you can kind of go back in the editing process to remove the ums right. and all that stuff if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And and for the record, Lisa said her her t-shirt says bougie on purpose. <laughs> I need that t-shirt. <laughs> I, I had one, but too many people told me that was on point. So I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my tip, my first tip is. It's not what you write, it's how you write it. Don't let other people's work stop you. So a lot of times people say, well, I wanna write about whatever the subject is, but so many other people have already written about that. And my, my I don't know where that came from, but my, um, my advice around that is, there might be a million topics out there that have the same, you know, the same kind of, flavor, but nobody can write what you would write, how you would write it. So just because somebody else has a topic on finance, just because somebody else wrote about domestic violence or whatever the subject is, your unique voice will be in your writing. So don't look at how many other people have already done it. Just go do it, you know, because exactly. you know, like Hans was just talking about, your voice is your voice. Nobody else is going to write like you write. So um, don't let that stop you. Exactly. I absolutely agree with that. You're up. <laughs> and that kind of ties into like the first one too about understanding your own tone. Um, because right. when you do that, you recognize that there that you have something different to offer. I mean, to offer, not author, but right. different to author as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, only that, not only that, certain people or different people can reach certain people, you know, exactly. so um, I might not be able to reach the same audience that Kwanzaa can reach. And I may not, or she might not be able to reach the people that I can reach because behind all of that is our own individual and unique stories exactly. that we bring to the table, you know, so I can't talk to somebody about what it's like to fight in Philly, but Kwanzaa can. <laughs> Like exactly. I have no, no idea what it was like growing up in West Philadelphia, but that's, you know, but Kwanzaa has that, you know, um, Kwanzaa may not have the experience that I have of, you know, not growing up with my father in the household, you know, so she might not be able to speak to that the same way that I could speak to that. Or I think you guys get what I'm trying to say. So yeah, don't let the fact that somebody else has already written about a topic stop you from, from writing your own unique story. Yep, I absolutely agree. 
cool. Um, and I'm going to go out of order a little bit, Kimmy. I don't know if you had my list, but I'm trying to follow the flow of the conversation. Oh, and I don't have your list in front of me. So. Okay. <laughs> so, but to tag on along to that, I would say that my second point, which will be our third point, is mm -hmm. to research. Um, make sure whatever it is that you're writing about that you are doing the proper research. Even for me, um, being from Philadelphia, I, I never forget in my first book, No Greater Love, um, it was set in Philadelphia and my editor was actually from Philadelphia. Hey, Amy, if you're watching. Um, so, but it was really awesome because I moved out of Philadelphia when I was like 17. And so I literally had to get a map of the city and all these different things to refresh my memory of like what street was next and what was in what area. And, you know, to kind of use that as a part of my research. Right. And not only that, but researching the language of the time that you're writing, um, if you're, if I'm writing about, you know, the eighties, you know, there was, there was certain slang that was used in the eighties, not to be cliche, um, right. but just really familiarizing yourself with the topic that you're writing about. Um, one of the things I realized was I went into the military uh, after high school. And so I got in the habit of using the word of saying restroom, but in Philadelphia, <laughs> we don't say restroom. <laughs> and so in my manuscript, you know, I had my character saying restroom and uh, my editor, she kind of was like, nobody says that, you know? So I was like, yeah, you're right. So just really being able to do the research to bring authenticity to your characters, bring authenticity to your story. Um, and then particularly when you're doing non-fiction, non it's incredibly important to do research, um, to yeah. make sure that the dots that you're trying to connect, that you're not forcing them to connect, but they do in fact connect. And I see this a lot of times um, when people are writing faith-based uh, uh, content, you know, they right. may try to take a scripture and really try to force it into the point that right. they're trying to make. But in reality, there's a perfect scripture that you can use that fits perfectly. So don't be afraid to take the time necessary to do your research. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that by saying, if you're going to put scripture in the book, you, you better make sure that it's the right one, that it's in the right context, that you have really done your homework, because I'm going to tell you, the saints will come for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't mess up the scripture. <laughs> but then it's a, it's a learning lesson as well, because I remember when I did uh, no greater love. And, and I used uh, a scripture from the book of Job and people were like, is that like, I like people literally went back and read the book of Job because they had never really read it before. And so when I kind of not just read it, but interpreted, interpreted it through this story, you know, people was like, oh, I didn't realize Job said that, you know, so it kind of pointed <laughs> people back, you know. Yeah. That's what I'm right. saying, though. When, when you go, you know, putting the scriptures in and adding them in and everything, you better be on point with it because yeah. folks will go search you out. Yeah. Thanks going to search you out. <laughs> Indeed. So that's a great point. Yes, yes, um, yes. So my number two, which is our number four, is what we, you know, hinted towards that got us to this whole conversation is never, ever skip the editing phase. Like if you can't, if you can't afford to edit, then you can't afford to be published yet. Amen. <laughs> and I, I just really, I really um, feel that because that is, that is a big deal. Um, there is nothing like reading a book in, you know, it's, it's one thing if it's, you know, far for, in between, but if you keep running up on those errors, it really takes away from your work. Right. And it really a distraction like I said after number three I'm pulling out a highlighter and it's like a game like five where's the next one <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll never forget like one time someone asked me to read their book and when I tell you the book had like 50 some errors in it wow. I am not joking. like I think it was 52 oh my gosh so so I contacted the author and I didn't really know the person and I was like you need to fire your editor and um, he was like, well, can you, can you tell me where to edit, where the mistake where I say is too many? Everywhere, right? <laughs> it's like everywhere. <laughs> so I was like, I tell you what, I was like, I actually was highlighting them as I went through. So I'm going to mail this book back to you. Wow. <laughs> and so I did. I mailed the book back to, um, to the author with Along all with the highlights. Invoice. Right. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually had 
all those revisions made and then did give me credit when he oh, reprinted awesome. the book um, to say that I helped in that process. But I was like, right. I can't, like, I can't not say anything. And even with the person that had the 14 errors, I sent her a note. And I oh, don't wow. know. Because I, I feel like, and I'm not doing it to like be overly critical, but I think right. as, as a fellow author, I think I have a responsibility. You know, some people get all in their feelings about it, but right. you know, like I'm not saying this to be rude or anything. And I gave her book a good review on Amazon because I'm not trying to, you know, mess up that. But behind the scenes, I sent her another message that said, hey, you know, your book had 14 errors and it can be a little distracting for somebody like me. Right. You know, that's, that's a good response. Gia and Kwanzaa, you good on their page, but <laughs> right. But I'll tell you, it's funny because I'm cringing because you were at my second book launch, according to your faith. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, I like I literally I, I went, I rushed through that whole process. Um, mm -hmm. and I had so many errors because I was trying to work towards a deadline. I had so yeah. many errors in that book. Um, mm -hmm. that I couldn't even, I, I had my launch, but I couldn't even really sell the books because they were just wow. full of errors. So I had to immediately go, so lost the whole printing, you know, wow. um, and everything. So that was an expensive lesson learned for me. It is. So. It is. And especially if you, I mean, the thing is you're asking people to purchase your work. Exactly. exactly. So I just think that it's rude to not go through the editing process and I think where, where a lot of people get caught up is they go through the editing process and they figure, you know, okay, my book was edited by a professional editor. It's good. But you right. also right. have to do your due diligence to go back and do that proofreading. Now, I do it for my authors. Um, when it, you know, when the professional editing part's over, I go okay. back to that entire book before it's released. And I always catch at least eight to 10 errors even after it's back from professional editor. Right. That proofreading part is like, it's critical um, because I would have been so embarrassed if the book went out. They were like, who was your publisher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it reflects the author, but on the publisher too. Because exactly. even if you had 14, I went back and looked up on Amazon to see who my publisher was. <laughs> it wasn't first fruits, was it? It was not. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, so, so it's really important. Um, and so Lisa said, amen. She said, woo, I can't read a book that has multiple errors. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, I'll tell you, and I think I shared this on that post. I remember I, I would stress myself out. So like just detail, detail, detail. And I remember the relief I got. I'm not going to say who the author is, but I've seen several, you know, at this stage um, who are like well-known, um, big house publishing you know, multiple books, multiple titles under their belt. And it's refreshing for me as I still consider myself a young author, young publisher. It's refreshing for me to see that, okay, it, it's okay. You know, nobody's yeah. career ended. It, you know, it's not a career ending era. I think yeah. they're so, <clears throat> but if it's just, you know, I put the, the twice or there instead yeah. of the, and, you know, I can kind of right. show it's grace on that. <laughs> it's hard to catch everything. You know, right. and I know that because I've had stuff to go to print and, and I'm reading it back there and I'm like, what? Like you said, the, 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 it's like, okay, really? But the thing exactly. is, it's so close to the work because you're reading it over and over again, exactly. you know, that it's hard to catch everything. But, you know, I just don't feel like you just have to do your due diligence to make it the best possible product that you can before it leaves, um, before it hits Amazon or wherever you're going to be selling it from because you are asking people to pay for your work. Exactly. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, and I and I think along with that, um, and I guess this will be my, this will be number four. Five. Number four or five? Five. I think it's <laughs> our number five. I think it's your number. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Next. It's like, no, I think Next. this is number five because you did number four. I did. Okay. So number five, just along those same lines is for me, um, not to stress over the process, especially if you're putting arbitrary deadlines on yourself. It's one thing when you're working with, even if you're working with um, an agent or working with a publisher, uh, if, if you don't have a realistic deadline, then kind of push back on that deadline. Um, mm -hmm. But when you start putting additional stress on yourself, you know, based on this arbitrary uh, uh, deadline, which was the case with me, like I said, with uh, uh, according to your faith, 
I had this deadline. I wanted it out by this date so I can have this launch mm -hmm. before this. And right. I just put this crazy deadline on myself. And I thought because the book was not massive, I was like, oh, I can, I can go back and comb through it. And when I yeah. tell you, I was like way too close to it. It was like yeah. <laughs> truly one of those, you can't see the forest for the trees. Like my mind literally filled in a blank and corrected all the errors that was there. Right. And when I went to print, I thought I was good. And literally on the very first page, <laughs> oh, when wow. it came from print and I opened that book, there was an error right there. And I was just like, how in the world did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, but because I put this, you know, this ridiculous deadline on myself, it added pressure and, you know, yeah. pressure to the process. And I was cutting corners in every way that I could cut corners. So uh, the mm -hmm. fifth piece of advice is, you know, uh, don't stress over the process. You know, enjoy the process. I always tell writers, enjoy the process, especially if you're putting the pressure on yourself. Don't do that. Right. Yeah, enjoy like don't process. schedule, don't schedule your launch date before your book even goes to the editor. Like <laughs> Yes. Because if there are, you know, if there are uh, you know, some things that need to be worked on, some things that need to be fixed, then like you said, you you put that own pressure on yourself. Exactly. And then you got a product that's not, you know, up to par. So, um, uh, I think it's Chatone Morrison. I hope I said your name right. She said, thank you for talking about this. Oh, and Gia, confirmed, Gia confirmed that we are on number five. Well, now we're on number six. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, number six would be stop making excuses about why you can't write. Now. <laughs> Because, okay, so we hear a million excuses about why a person can't write. And the number one excuse that I hear is like, I just can't find the time. Well, that can't really be a lot of people's excuse anymore <laughs> right now. You should have, most people right now have all the time in the world. Like, that, that excuse has been totally eliminated. But I'm saying that to say um, most times when people are making excuses about why they can't write, it has, it's rooted in fear. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You know, they, they don't believe that they can do what it is that they want to do. And so stop making all the excuses about it. Ask the questions that you need to ask um, in order to be able to move forward. Because it's not really about you don't have time. Um, it's, most times it's not even really about you don't have money. Um, you know, it might be right now because... <laughs> Of where we are, but you know, most most publishers have payment plans and all that kind of stuff. But usually, that's not the thing that's stopping you. Um, is fear of something. So figure out what that thing is. Ask the questions of people like us who are willing to ask questions. Now, I'm not saying don't call for the pick my brain session because that has a fee. <laughs> We're happy to help, you know, where we can here and there, but exactly. really, you know, um, just figure out what it is and stop making excuses about why you can't write because ultimately there's somebody who needs what you're sitting on. Yes. I like you that. Who yeah. needs what you're sipping on? That's what you said? Sitting on. Oh, sitting on. I thought you said sipping on. I was like, huh. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You funny. What you doing over there? <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to hear, but my brain is all over 50 million other people. Yeah. But I like that too, what you're sitting on in. I guess what you're sipping on. You know, I think both of them can work. <laughs> you over here chilling and sipping on something, you should be right, and we go with that. And so, and so Lisa, Lisa M. Jones said, I wrote in four anthologies last year, and I am not a writer. Yeah, so oh, that's wow. one of the other excuses. One of the other excuses, you know what? I'm not really a writer. You do not have to be a writer to write. Exactly. You know, if there's something, you know, that's on your heart to share with people, there's a message in there. That's what editors and book coaches and, you know, people like us are for to help you to be able to flush that story out. So don't get caught up on, you know, well, I'm not a writer. I didn't go to school. I didn't take a journalism class or a writer's class or all of that kind of stuff. Don't get hung up there because if you have a message that's supposed to be shared um, with the world, it's just solely based on your experiences and um don't let them hang you up thank you lisa for that yeah that's a good one you're up okay so to piggyback on you know what you said don't let anything um hang you up i will i would also say you know along with fear i think another thing and i got stuck with this myself but another thing is don't fall in love with the idea of writing do the mm. work <laughs> yeah I remember before I was published, I used to love to say that I'm a writer. 
And people are like, oh, I'm a writer. And then it's like, well, what have you written? Uh, well, I'm working on, you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's like, don't fall in love with the idea of writing. Actually write. And mm-hmm. let me plug it on myself. Actually yeah, write. Yeah, I always say nothing happens until you write. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I think that's a good one, too, um, because a lot of times we can just fall in love with the idea. And not even just in writing, I, you know, fall in love with the idea of a lot of different things and not actually do the work that's required. True. So one True. of the things, even as a publisher, when people say, oh, I'm a writer, you know, it's like, well, you know, what have you written? Obviously, it's the first question. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you say, well, share with me something that you've written, because I remember the first time mm-hmm. that I actually had an opportunity to share something that I've written. And this is when I was, you know, starting off as a young writer and looking for an agent and all of this. Mm-hmm. And I never forget, I was at a friend's, um, she was hosting a local author and, you know, I was talking to the author and I was just like, yeah, I'm a writer. And she was like, oh, what have you written? And I, it, you know, I found myself <laughs> like three chapters in, <laughs> you know, to No Greater Love, but oh. I had been three chapters in to No Greater Love for like a year. And oh, wow. so, so, you know, I shared with her, I was like, oh, I wrote this book and, you know, I'm still looking for an agent. And she was like, oh, well, send it to me. Um, I would, you know, I would love to read it. And I like went home and immediately start like typing like a mad woman just mm-hmm. to get her three, you know, three readable yeah. chapters. And then she read those three chapters and she was like, oh, I would love to send that to my agent. You know, do you have more? And so it was like, uh, let's see how she's like, oh, lady. Three, you know. <laughs> So she yes. sent her the first three and now I'm, you know, writing like a mad woman wow. again just to get more. So don't fall in love with the idea. Honestly, if that thing is in you, just take the time, whatever time is necessary to really get it from your heart, from your mind, from your spirit onto the page. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so I think we're on my number seven. On Number seven is cover design. Um, So I want to stress the importance of cover design. Your cover design matters. Yes. Um, One, for one, it should kind of reflect what you're writing about. I remember I saw a book cover one time and I looked at the title and I was struggling to figure out what does this image have to do with this title? You know, your your book cover image is the first thing that people are going to see. Right. You know, and if that's not so people usually look at the cover, they look at the title on the cover. Yeah. And then if those two things seem interesting, they might turn it on the back to kind of see what the book is about. And then they may open it up to see what the table of contents is, right? Exactly. If your cover is I was going to say jacked up. I was looking for better words, but <laughs> they wouldn't come. Your cover's jacked up. You know, you're, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yes. Um, and, and don't, if you are not artistically inclined, yes. don't try to create your own book covers. You know, I know that there are programs out there that say you can do it yourself. <laughs> but if that's not your strong suit, right? Stop. Just don't, just, just don't, don't do it because really, um, you, like I said, you're doing yourself a disservice because that's one of the very first things that people are going to encounter, and it reflects on you as a writer, yes, as a published author. Um, so you know, I, I was working with somebody one time, and her son had created her book cover. And I had created the cover for her. And then she came and said, oh, my son did this. I love it. And I felt like I was being punked. <laughs> like, huh? Oh. And, and, and so, like, so my, re- you know, I, I had to have a conversation like, okay, maybe I misunderstood what you told me your vision is for this project. Right. You know, so we had to have that whole conversation. So, so don't, don't get caught up in, you know, my cousin. Exactly. He used to draw when he was in the third grade. <laughs> exactly. Um, just, just don't do it. Like yeah. put out a respectable product if you're going to do it at all. And like I said, if that's not your strong point, hire someone to do that. Or, you know, it's in all of our packages. Cover design is in all of our packages um, because the first I had one that said you could come with your own cover design and then I saw some of the stuff I was getting. I was like, oh, 
hey, that's not going to work. Yeah. Because ultimately, yeah. you know, my name, my publishing company name is inside your book. Or yeah. Your, you know, your name, your publishing company name is on stuff that you produce and you don't want things out there because people do say, well, who let that go? Exactly. And, and I, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I'll tell you, um, it's funny because my son designed and I always have my books near me. So mm -hmm. um, not that I'm like trying to plug or anything, but where I'm at is kind of like my office. <laughs> So everything is within, within, within reach. Oh, that's um, good. Son, Not all the way over there. <laughs> yes. I'll have my, son, he designed my book cover. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I loved it. So this was right. my third book. And I'm working on my fourth book. And I, you know, I got this image that I really love. And I sent it to my son because he did such a beautiful job with my third book. And, you know, I didn't have yeah. to offer too much, you know, feedback. He just took what I had and made what he wanted. And it came out beautifully. Right. So with this, the, um, my fourth book, I sent him this image and I was like, oh, son, you know, can you design do my book, fourth book cover? You know, this is the image mm -hmm. that I want to use. And he said it's something totally different. And we kind of went back and forth, you know, probably by about 15, 20 times. Wow. And I was just like, all right, son. <laughs> <laughs> I think this relationship is over right here. You know, this, this business thing, uh, only because we just could not get on the same page, board. you know, yeah. and he was getting frustrated because, you know, oh. as a designer, you know, it's like, this is taking time, mom, you know, I don't have yeah. time to make these little tweaks, you know, right. um, <laughs> so we just kind of had to part ways on this particular project with regard, you know, to this book, uh, book cover. Right. Um, so it doesn't matter, you know, family or not, business is business. Business is business. Um, <laughs> I yeah. just hope you continue to let me work with them. But, you know, also <laughs> to your point, I was actually just doing a coaching session earlier mm -hmm. and a young lady I was talking to, she, you know, of course shared the, her book cover with me. And, you know, one of the questions I said, okay, so what is your book cover like based off of what it is you're, you're writing about? What does your book cover have to do with that? Right. And it was everything from the title to the imagery that was on there, nothing. I was, you know, I was like, so what, you know, what does this tell the person? If I was in a bookstore and I picked this book cover off the shelf, what am I to get from that? And, yeah. um, you know, she began to explain. I said, well, I don't, I wouldn't have the luxury of your explanation That's standing right. in the bookstore. I said, so everything on here ought to, you know, really tell what your book is about. And mm -hmm. she didn't have a subtitle. And I'm like, I think people miss the fact of how valuable subtitles are. Exactly. Like, you know, I told her, I said, you can keep your title, but you have to offer a subtitle, something to really say what the content of this, this, this manuscript is about. And then also, yeah. you know, work around the, the picture, the image as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And she just started crying because I guess it didn't click for her. She didn't, I mean, not that she cried because she was upset. She cried because, right. it was like, yeah, you know, it was like eye opening. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really excited, you know, as for me as a, a publisher to be able to offer what I thought was simple information, but was something really valuable for her. Um, mm -hmm. So I absolutely agree. Your, your cover is a part of the packaging. So, yeah, you definitely want to okay. make sure that that is on point. Yeah. So somebody just asked the question, when is it okay? When is it an okay idea to put your face on the book cover? Um, I think, I personally think if, I think one, if the book has to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to keep pointing back to my, to my projects, but on my last book, that image actually came from a picture of me. You wouldn't mm -hmm. know that it's a picture of me because of the way that it was, um, you know, designed. But that was a right. picture of me. The book mm -hmm. is about me. Um, I could have been really overt and just had like my full face on the cover. Um, but to me, that wasn't very creative and it didn't reflect yeah. the, you know, the story that I was telling. Um, but then on my first book, my husband is actually the model on my cover. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I see a lot of people yeah. with their picture on the cover. I, I think it depends on maybe if you're setting yourself up as maybe as a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. That it might be appropriate yeah, then, perhaps. Say. Yeah. Yeah. If you, I think if you're from a branding perspective, if you're really trying to brand yourself, you know, for a certain thing, right. Um, right. If you already have an established audience that follows you, you know, you have, you know, Twitter follows, you have your Instagram, right. and you've already sort of been building your brand. I think it's okay to do it then if, you know, that subject matter lends to that. Um, I, I I don't know. I I can't say that it adds value or 
takes away from, I mean, you know, if, if you're famous, that's one thing, right. <laughs> because right. of recognition. but you think about it, if you're, you know, your book is in a bookstore, like people aren't saying, oh, that's Kwanzaa, if they don't right. know you. Um, but I think if you have an established brand and you, you know, you have that type of visibility where people will recognize you, then that's one thing. But um, I just think there, it depends on what the topic is and it depends on who you're trying to reach. Yeah. Um, you know, because sometimes you could cancel out a whole demographic. So right. just you know, being honest, so you have to take things into consideration, like who, is, who exactly are you trying to reach? Um, and does your image on the front cover help you to get that message across? Right. Because your mama might think you're cute, but the world might not think you're cute. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. It's been a long day. But yeah, yeah. everything you said, Kimberly. Honestly, though, because I've seen some people who've had their picture on their cover, and I'm like, yeah, why did you do that in that way? Um, yeah, and I, yeah, it just didn't make me want to right. buy it, truthfully. Um, now, you know, we just published Jared's book, The Truth About the Truth, and his picture is on the cover, but it's his, him facing himself, so it's a profile image of him facing, but it had to and do the book with... book is about him, right? right? It's his book about him. And he, it was a broken image of him that looked like shattered glass, and it was the whole image of him looking at himself, but it was the truth about the truth, and it was his story. So that's right. a little different than I'm writing a business book and I'm trying to go into corporate arenas um, and teach on X, Y, Z, unless right. you're a really well-known uh, established speaker or something like that already, um, that just might not, it might not be the best thing, but it's always a personal decision. Yeah, and I agree. So, so I guess okay. I'm, am I my last one? No, I was, I was reading some of the- um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, but just like uh, people are happy that we're talking about the cover, the cover thing, and <laughs> that's a big one, though. It really is. It's huge. It's huge because you can like really, um, you know, while we're on the cover, here's here's another thing that I'll say too because I got question on this when I wrote the book. Um, when we did the anthology, A Threefold Chord Broken, What Happens When Christian Marriages Fail. And I actually think I called you to get advice on this when I had a white couple on the front of the book. Right, yeah. A black couple on the front of the book. And, I, and, and some of my homies, you know, were like, <laughs> Why do you have a white cover, a white couple on on the book versus a black guy? And I was like, you know, well, I, I mean, I I think I consciously did that because right. I wanted the book to have that crossover. I didn't right. want it to be like, oh, this is a book that's talking about black married couples. Um, exactly. it, it, it's always a delicate balance when you do stuff like that. But I just I wanted my book to have a certain reach, and um. And so that's what I went with. Yeah. You know, I remember but like, that. all about personal decision, decision. And um, and I remember calling Kwanzaa and saying, look, <laughs> so is, is it really, is it really that big a deal that I'm an African American writer, but I put white people on the cover cover of my book? Like, but some people questioned it. Yeah. You know? But I ultimately kept it like that because, you know, I wanted it to um yeah, that's a whole nother conversation right there. Well, so what had a, a question or? No, that the, the, this oh. whole thing because because it's just that that delicate balance because I feel like we will pick up a, a book more easily with our um, Caucasian people on the front of it than a Caucasian person would pick up a book that had, you know, and, and for as messed up as that may be, right. you know, I think it's reality. And so that's why I chose to do it. And Lisa said, that's called marketing. You know, I knew my target demographic. I knew who I wanted to reach and I knew I didn't want there to be any barriers to reaching that audience. And it turned out right. really well. So, so yeah. So woo, I guess that horse is dead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You're so up. I think I'm on, I guess I'm on my fifth one. Right. And I think this is our number eight. Okay. Uh, I'm number nine, if I'm on the fifth oh. one. Okay. Yeah. 
You're right. Yeah, I'm we're good. writers, not mathematicians, right? <laughs> I certainly am not. <laughs> yeah. So um, my fifth one, which is our number nine, number nine, is, and this is a big one for me, um, especially being, you know, um, a Christian publisher, a Christian mm-hmm. writer. Um, this has been a big one throughout my just my career of writing and publishing. Um, so my fifth one is don't exchange authenticity for opportunity. Okay. I want to say that again. Don't exchange authenticity for opportunity. This goes back to recognizing your voice, understanding your voice, because really at the end of the day, for you to be a writer is because you have something to say. Mm -hmm. Um, And you should be serious and passionate and connected to that thing that you have to say. And so this is just a matter of someone saying, hey, I'll give you an extra few dollars if you write about this. You know, Mm -hmm. writing it, for me, I always say writing is the gift. You know, um, and what I write really is is just me using my gift to uh, express my 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 beliefs and express you know who I am. Um, and so, if I could be paid, just I could write anything mm-hmm. because that's the gift. But if it's not authentic and true to me, then why would I do it? So that's always been my kind of thing. Um, and I can say, even mm-hmm. as a writer, I remember. One of my very first opportunities to uh, showcase my book, I was at a writer's conference or writer's event. And I remember I just had my one book, uh, No Greater Love. And I was at this event and, you know, as a vendor, uh, and they, I act, actually had like a corner or, you know, a, an aisle booth, which I didn't realize as a vendor in big conferences, that's like prime real estate. And so right. it's just like, okay, great. You know, and I had no idea. I was completely you know, uh, wet behind the ears, had no idea how great position God had put, how great God had positioned me at this um, this, mm-hmm. this conference. And then there was a guy that set up next to me. He actually had two booths. You know how you can buy like your little section? Yeah. He actually purchased two sections and he was like a bookstore. <laughs> so this guy had like hundreds of <clears throat> books, two mm. sections. He was like right next to me. I'm here with my one book. I think he had books like, three for fifteen dollars or something i'm here selling my one book for fifteen dollars oh lord and, <laughs> and i remember setting up and he came over he was like hey you know do you can you um switch with me and i was like no you know i'll stay right here you know really had no idea i just didn't feel like moving so i was like no like, right. i'm good but the reality was is for me i look at it the favor of god that was on the mm-hmm. project that was right. and what it is that he's purposing me to do, you know, the gift that he's given me, me using it back to point people back to him. When mm-hmm. I say he showed me so much favor during that conference, I mean, people didn't even hear this guy had three books for $15. I had one book, one title. Wow. And I had a line of people purchasing my book and people were just kind of perusing his. Um, yeah. So it was such an eye opener. So, you know, I always say don't don't uh, uh, I guess dim what it is that you know that you know you're supposed to do just mm-hmm. to try to get, just just to try to get on with somebody else if I can use some right. language just to try to get on with somebody else. Um, but then the same thing even as a publisher, um, you know, as a Christian publisher, I, I can remember times where people was, you know want to sit down and talk with me as a publisher, and it's like, oh, I'm a writer. It's like, well, what do you write? And they start you know expressing some stuff that's inconsistent with my genre. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I've like, had that too. <laughs> I'm like, well, you, I'm a Christian publisher. And it's like, okay, you know, but it's like research me or research yeah. any publisher. And this is probably one of the bonuses I was talking about, but research publishers to make sure that you're fitting one into the market that you best mm-hmm. fit into. And then that you're working with not just the publisher, but if you're working with an agent, if you're working with an editor, everybody mm-hmm. that you're working with has to have some kind of way be consistent with the, you know, with the genre that you're writing. Um, mm-hmm. And so don't trade your authenticity just for an opportunity because there is a, a, an agent that will represent you if yeah. you're no matter what it is that you're writing. There's a publisher that will fit, you know, whatever genre mm-hmm. is that you're writing in. So don't just try to force fit you and your your, your skill or your craft or your gift somewhere where it doesn't fit, you know, just oh, wait I heard for right say, oh, What I heard you say was don't pimp your gift. <laughs> But yeah, then that's that. <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> yeah, no, just just for the sake of doing something. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So that's good stuff. Um, <laughs> she said real ratchet stuff. Oh. <laughs> I had a thought, and I I, I think I lost it. Um, <laughs> oh man, it was a good one too. Hold up, let me let me see. 
maybe it'll, it'll come back to me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> These days, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, I like, so help I us Holy Spirit, Spirit is there. Huh? <laughs> I said, help us Holy Spirit, it's there. Right? Yeah, because it'll it, come it's, back to your memory. Yeah, and all the stuff that you were talking about, was like, oh, yeah, I remember. Um, it, it was it was a certain scenario, a situation that had happened. Um, oh, I think it was. Yeah, so it was somebody that I was talking to about a book project that they were wanting to write, write you know, because, you know, you're a publisher. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Yes. In the subject matter that she was trying to write about, she didn't have any experiences of her own to lend to that project. So I couldn't understand, like, why are you doing this? Right, like really married to this, and I'm like, well, how do you intend to market it? Because she was having a hard time marketing it. Yeah. And so my question was like, what is your personal relationship to this topic? Like, right. what's making you choose that? And um, and so it was it was a really interesting conversation because I, I just really didn't know where to go with it because there was no personal connection. So it was like, why are you just you know are you doing it just to be doing it like you were just talking about? Yeah. So that was that thought. It's like you have to. It's easier to talk about and easier to sell something that you have exactly. a, an authentic connection with or an experience that you have been through to connect to that. So. It just helps you in, in marketing and sales and all that stuff. So, right. and I think a lot of people try to try to get on, you know, jump on trends. Yeah. Um, so even things like you see it a lot, especially when, um, you know, you see it a lot with people. They want to do uh, fashion, or they want to do makeup, or they want to do hair care, and all these different things that you know they don't even have. And not that they don't have the background to do. Right. Um, I'm I'm natural. I've been natural for almost ten yeah. years, but I am not a hair expert. I know how to do Kwanzaa's hair. <laughs> Clearly, you can but, see. You know, <laughs> being like, ten years I natural has not made me. Right. Yeah. Being ten years <laughs> natural has not made me an expert in natural hair. You right. Know? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, because I'm definitely not. <laughs> and it's, I've been natural for a while too. Right. But, okay, so we're on number ten, I think. Yes. Okay, so my the number ten one, number ten tip is how to. Uh, it's rejection, rejection, handling bad reviews. So what to what? How do you handle those bad reviews? Because when you write, you are essentially releasing your, you know, that, that baby that you worked on for so long and you're so connected to, and now you put it out on Amazon and it's out there for the world to see, uh, and you are going to have an opinion. Um, you open yourself up to that. Yeah. So I, I try to tell people not to get too discouraged. Now we all have feelings, you know, and you can have 20 good reviews and you have that one person that's going to yes. say, don't bother, don't waste your money, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh. You know, I saw somebody get upset uh, about a review in one of our write in one of the writing groups on Facebook. She said, because the person gave her a one, but they didn't say why. So you know how in Amazon you can hit the rating? They gave her oh. a one star, but they didn't write a review. That's means. <laughs> Right. And so the person was really upset. And she's like, I'm feeling really discouraged. I'm really upset. You know, what? at least give me the feedback of saying. So that's one thing to remember, too. If you're going to give feedback, give feedback. Right. If you're going to give somebody a one or two or three. Say what it was. Because ultimately, even though our feelings may get hurt as authors, if you give us anything less than a five, <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to look at it as a learning experience. So. Right. After you get out of your feelings, you know, you read it, try to go back and see if there's any validity to what that person is saying. Right. So, um, yeah. That would help you grow as an author. Like, so don't just get caught up on, oh my gosh, well, that person was hating. Well, <laughs> really? really? Like, you know, I mean, I've, seen, I've seen some books that had some really, really harsh reviews. Yeah. Um, and one of the biggest ones is because of errors. Did this person really even play an editor at all? Um, wow. And some you know, well-known writers, you know, that get those type of reviews. But then you do have some people that are just reviewing, you know, that are hating, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um, people are out there too. But I, I just always say, like, when you get those reviews in, look at the review, 
um, after you get out of your feelings, check it and see if there's any anything valid that that person is saying that can help you to grow as a writer. Right. Um, but but don't say, you know, if you have 20 reviews and they're all five stars beyond your family and your friends, <laughs> Because you know, you know, when we tell our family and friends to go review our book on Amazon, we want five stars. Exactly. But once your book is really out there into the marketplace and people start to review it, um, you know, don't there are some and there are some like um, book club or, or there are people that write reviews. That's what they do, but right. they give honest reviews, you know, and you have some people that hold their five star reviews for work that is impeccable. Right. I'm not saying that your work is so awful, but it's just how they rate. You know, it's sort of like at work in the in a you know yeah. corporate setting. You know, it's like every boss rates differently. You know, exactly. so uh, my, I guess my point is just like don't get all in your feelings if you get something that's less than a five. Um, look at it and and see it for what it is, and see if there's anything that in it that can help you to grow. Yeah. And I think anytime you're in a creative space, whether you're, you know, a writer, an artist or anything, mm -hmm. and you're creating something that you want to share with the world, you know, right. everybody has critics and everything, like I was saying earlier, everything is so relative. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, everything. Is, <laughs> of course, my brain is like thinking of a million examples, uh -huh. but things are super relative. So, yeah. you know, like Kimberly said, if someone says something, you know, see if there's something of value there yeah. that you can use to, you know, make your, you know, make your writing better or make it more appealing. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm super non-traditional um, as a publisher. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really don't track or follow reviews. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even, you know, I, I just don't tap into that at all. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think sometimes we can become, you know, we can arrest ourselves based mm -hmm. off of other people's thoughts or even a lack of. Right. You know, um, if you are releasing something and you're waiting for the feedback and it doesn't come, you know, you're, you're, you know, you uh, can be left thinking about like, man, well, wh wh what did you think? You know, yeah. and when you don't get that feedback, you're mm -hmm. left to kind of fill in a blank. And True. so I think if you if you know that what you presented was authentic to you, mm -hmm. if it was your best possible effort, right. um, then it honestly and again, I'm non-traditional. It doesn't matter what people think. <laughs> true. That's true. Because because the other point to that, too, is that your work is not for everybody. Exactly. So, And if I can share one example, um, like I said, I'm kind of in my office. I have some of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ralph Ellison, his mm -hmm. book, Invisible Man. I've seen this that. is hands down like one of the best books in the world to me. And I love this book so much. But one of the beautiful things about Ralph Ellison is this is the only book that he ever published while he was alive. And mm. the reason being is because when he published Invisible Man, it was just like this huge success. He won a Pulitzer Prize for it and everything, just like all these awards and all these accolades, he won for that book. Mm. And then he spent the rest of his life trying to measure up to that. Um, so his story really just inspired me as a writer. So wow. he never felt like anything else that he had ever written was good enough. And wow. so, um, uh, what is the word? Post usmus? Am I saying that right? After he passed, <laughs> I can never say that word. I After understand he passed, that language. Yes. <laughs> After he passed, his wife went into his office and she found piles and piles and piles of manuscripts that he wow. never published. And so after he passed, his wife published Juneteenth wow. um, you know, under his name. Um, and so these are the only two books that he that has ever been published under his name. Um, and I think she may have did like a collection of his writings, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that story as a writer so one, inspiring, but then yeah. two, kind of daunting because, mm -hmm. you know, when you allow the world to tell you that yeah. this is the standard and then you begin to even question your own gift and never wow. to write and publish anything else again in the rest of your life wow. was, um, so yeah, if I can just leave you guys with that, you know, uh, I, I think he's, and I think he's a phenomenal writer. I would have loved mm -hmm. to write, you know, more of what he had to write. Um, he, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So Tammy Wiley said, go to Toastmasters so you can practice receiving feedback. <laughs> oh, no. You have a hard time receiving feedback. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you. 
<laughs> it might be for somebody out there, though. So. Exactly. That's how they say I'm an artist, I'm sensitive. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, yeah, so those were the 10 tips. Um, did you have bonus tips or are we going to go right into, um, so we have, I forgot what we called it. What were we going to do? Um, so we're going to talk, I guess, share examples of, you know, some of our, our, our failures. Things or we our learned struggles. or something. Yeah, so lessons, things learned. That we learned, learned. lessons learned as a, as a publisher and then as an author. Correct. I think that's how that was. So yeah. it's on you because I did the last tip. <laughs> so it's back okay. to you. Um, so first thing as a, as an author, uh, I think the biggest lesson I've always, I continue to learn is to really trust my voice. And I say this all the time and anybody who's ever sat down with a, a coaching session with me, I say it all the time, learn your voice and trust your voice, um, and write. <laughs> yeah. So I've had, you know, I've had opportunities where, um, you know, I've had opportunities to write for other, uh, genres but mm -hmm. it wasn't authentic to who I am. Mm -hmm. And, and so being able and having, having the courage and confidence to say, no, that's not what I do. <laughs> it yeah. really does take bravery. Um, and so I think one of my biggest lessons really is when you put yourself out there, um, and you say, even, even, it, you know, bringing it back to your brand, you know, mm -hmm. I am a woman of faith. So, Everything that you honestly, most things that you will ever find me either uh, in a public facing, whether it's me speaking or writing, is always going to point back to my faith. And it doesn't mean that I can't, you know, I can't um, communicate or relate to people of other faiths because that's mm -hmm. not the case. But I always, you know, my faith is very important to me. And I understand as a writer, for me, I recognize that my gift to write is a gift that God gave me. And right. for me, it's for, you know, the purpose for what he, what it is that he's doing through me. Mm -hmm. um, so as a writer, just really understanding one, where my gift comes from, mm -hmm. um, and then giving my gift back to, you know, back to God. I always think about that, that, uh, that scripture. And I, I think I was just talking to someone about this, but there's a scripture in the Bible and it says, um, uh, uh, what's more sacred, the gift or the gift, the altar or the gift that the gift or the altar that the gift is placed on. And I mm. always think about that. Um, and so I know for me, God gave me the gift, but me placing it back and giving it back to God, that's what make it sacred. So understanding that, you know, as a writer, your gift is sacred. And right. use the word of Kimberly, don't pimp out your gift. If I can use <laughs> pimp and God in the same, the same little thing, but <laughs> yes. We can, today, it's, it's sweet, we're good. We're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so let's see a lesson learned as an author and i had it see i that that part i didn't write down so i'm like it was just there i cannot be oh, behind on my memory anymore <laughs> but let's see as an author um hmm i guess i would just say trust trust yourself enough to release your message. Trust God mm -hmm. enough to release your message for that matter. Um, if there's something that you are supposed to do, do it. And don't let fear hold you back from doing, doing it. Because I think I talked about that a little bit earlier about one of those excuses that you used. So I would just say, um, I think all of the experiences that we go through in life, they aren't for us. You know, we, we've gone through those things. If we have come out on the other side of it. I, I think we have a responsibility to right. give back and to help those people coming behind us that may have may be encountering those things that we've already overcome. So if that book is in you, and that's the way, yeah, and you know, if you're supposed yeah. to do that, you know, you ultimately know when it's time to write. And if you have a message that you're supposed to get out to the world, so just don't let anything stop you because there is definitely somebody who needs what you have. Absolutely. So I think that's my that's my author one, and so then I have one as a publisher. Uh, lessons learned as a publisher. <laughs> yes. Does you want me to do my lessons learned as a publisher? Yes. So I think for me, there's so many, but I will stick with this one. Um, as a publisher, for me, first use publishing. You know, for me, I believe that everything that God has called me to do, you know, it, it comes with a particular mandate, uh, you know, foundation scripture, scripture even. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so whenever I'm doing anything, like I'm really uh, careful about the authors that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really careful about the work, the projects that I work with, whether it's as a publisher, whether it's as a coach, whatever it is, um, really careful about those things. Um, and so as a publisher, again, it goes back to just the authenticity of what it is that you're trying to do. So it's like, if I was a cheese, you know, if I was making cheese and that was my job to make cheese, then what sense would it be for me to, you know, to put the, to try to make something else cheese, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because that's not cheese. My job is to make cheese. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Analogy. Process, it's like really just doing, <laughs> doing what you know to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember looking at or working with, um, uh, you know, people that, you know, that'll come and particularly working in, and this is probably really sensitive, but I'm going to go there because I am a faith-based publisher. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, even working with, uh, you know, ministers or, you know, uh, church leaders or different people, men, you know, different uh, people of the faith who are at mm -hmm. different levels or whatever, and they're wanting to write a book. And, mm -hmm. you know, they may sit down and say, hey, can you talk with me about this project that I'm working on? And even in my spirit, it just doesn't feel like, like mm. it's something that I'm supposed to be connected to. And people yes. will look at it it's like, well, aren't you a, a Christian publisher? It's like, yeah, but even in the spirit, you don't connect to everything. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. so, you know, a lot of times people, you know, kind of feel some kind of way because I would say, oh, that's not something I would work with, or that's not something, you know, and I yeah. really do, I'm telling you, um, I really do pray about the projects. I actually just kind of, I'm kind too. of coming off a hiatus with regards to First Roots Publishing, um, because I was trying to work on a few of my own projects. But even as I come off a hiatus, I'm still, you know, very sensitive um, yeah. as far as, you know, the people that I work with in, a, in, the, in the message, even within their message, because as a publisher, it's like, I'm standing behind what you said. And exactly. Particularly the way, you know, particularly the way that my business model is structured, uh, first mm -hmm. publishing, we invest in our writers. So there's mm -hmm. no cost to the writer. Every, all of the financial cost is coming from me. So I have to be 100% right. on board before I invest in it. So, yeah. you know, maybe in that, that's not regard, my model. A different, right. So maybe in that regard, it might make a little, a little different. Um, but I'm incredible. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Because but you, I, you I, do I, Christian work, do you? No, but I'm not okay. doing anything ratchet either. Right. So, <laughs> you know, with that same thing, like I have not, you know, positioned myself as a Christian publishing house. Right. Um, however, you know, there are things like on, on the website, it clearly says like we're not publishing any urban fiction, no erotica, all that kind of stuff, because right. that, that's not who I am. Right. Um, you know, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing that because for one, I have to read it and read it and read it again. Exactly. I need all that up in my spirit. I'm single yes, woman. But, uh, exactly. Exactly. But um, just, just to your point, um, and I don't, man, we said we would do 40 minutes. It's, it's over an hour. <laughs> but people are still here. People are still here. But um, <laughs> so to your point about that, um, I, I always say all money is not good money. Exactly. And, um. I want to work with people like I pray to God to send me the people who are assigned to me that I'm Amen. supposed to help to birth their projects into the world. I take that very seriously. And so and, and on those occasions when I've had people to come my way that like you were talking about alignment. Um, and it didn't feel right. And right. I was you know, second guessing myself and I kind of, you know, started to move forward with it. And I had to pull out because I'm like, this is not making me feel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I think we have a tendency to try to ignore things. But then I had to come to the conclusion, like all money is not good money. Um, you know, because of course we have a different model than you do. Um, as right. far as how you're structured and people do pay for my services, but just because you have the money to pay for my services does not mean right. that, um, that that's your, your end. Um, it's about more than that for me. And I want to be proud of the work that I release under Laboo Publishing, you know, because I consider this to be my family's legacy. And so I don't want, you know, anything that's not um, of great value coming out of our publishing house. So it does matter. Um, all money is money and, and, you know, we're not accepting everything. And now I've learned, <clears throat> and this wasn't even my 
my one, but I've <laughs> learned, you know, um, over the last few years to pay attention to how I feel about yeah. certain projects because it really is important. And if it's stressing me out from the get go, it doesn't belong. In, right. You know, I mean, there's there's good stress and there's bad stress, and if if no, <laughs> so I've learned to pay yeah. attention um, to those red flags and stuff, and so I don't accept everything. Um, exactly. Other lesson lesson that I've learned as a publisher, I mean, I've had <laughs> I've had some some hard lessons come my way. Um, is when you are writing, talking to the author, when the author is writing, you can't just um okay so i've had i've had a what do you call that uh trademark issues uh people coming after me you using my stuff no i'm not what do you mean i guess I was um, thinking, oh you said trademark i'm thinking copyright okay go, what? <laughs> trademark um okay the title of your book is infringing on the trademark oh. of my company no, you know, so you got to know your stuff. One, as a publisher, you have to have um, uh, attorneys <laughs> at hand yeah. um, to help you. And so, you know, those were things that I, I, and I thank God now for the lessons because now I know, and it made me dig deeper into all of that oh, yeah. as far as law and everything behind um, publishing, um, you know, but, but that part of it and then the whole copy well copyright is another one but then uh what's what's the other one called um where you think somebody talking about you oh um, um, that's um oh that good I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? well first thing you write you're writing something and somebody it. comes it's, right. it's, it's, oh what's the word kwanzaa I, it's right there on the tip of my tongue, too. I know. But I always use, like, just a disclaimer. You know, the same little disclaimer. Right. You know. Uh, Even if it sounds know. like I'm talking about you, I'm not talking about you. Yeah, something to that effect. Like, right. you know, the characters and scenarios are completely fictitious. You know, they are not based right. on any true right. character. You know, kind of use that whole little disclaimer. Yeah, but it is a word for that, and I can't. Um, it, It's not malicious. It's it's something with the M. Jesus, I can't remember the word for it, but but yeah. basically, you know, it, it's because of the nature of the things that my authors write about. You know, we have to be careful that, um, you know, you're not doing anything that's damaging to anybody right. else, and um, and we actually right. have that in our contract um, that that's against the rules. Um, right. But because people are, you know, having a lot of their personal stories and what have you, there's a way to do that so that you are not um, always messing up that I cannot think of a word. Yeah. But, um, you know, for the most part, you're, you know, it's you kind of along the whole libel and slander. Yeah, it's, it's another word. It's, it's right up yeah. there with slander. Um, but yeah, so so just really maliciously trying to hurt, harm someone with the things that you're saying. Right. So I've had to learn a lot about that. <laughs> and um, you know, the legal legal thing is no joke. So yeah. you know, just um, think about what you're writing. You know, and then the other the whole other thing is about the copyright. Like if you're if you're going and you're googling things on you know the web to put into your book and everything, you have to do your due diligence to be citing those things and and what have you. So I've learned a, you know a lot of um, a lot of lessons along the way as a publisher. It's been really interesting, but all of it has helped me to grow. So I'm grateful. Exactly. And I'll tell you what's funny for me, even as you know as a Christian publisher, I never forget I was working with. Um, a client um, and, you know, she, you know, she had sent her manuscript. We were, you know, planning to meet that, you know, that following week to kind of talk through it. So I'd already started going through with my edits and my thoughts. And I realized that she was using a lot of scripture from, I think it was like the Jewish something Bible. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I had, you know, I was looking at it because a lot of what I do is either King James or NIV. So right. I mean. is either from <clears throat> King James or NIV. Uh, mm -hmm. But she was using this Jewish something Bible. And right. uh, like I'm looking at the the uh, translation in the Jewish Bible, then I'm looking at it in, I think it was like either the, the NIV, it was very similar. Mm -hmm. Like it was, there was no difference, no real difference. Oh. And so I was explaining to her, um, 
you know, so she called me like before our meeting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to meet on Saturday, but she called me before <laughs> the meeting and she was like, oh, I just can't wait to hear your feedback. You know, anything that you could tell me that I can start looking at now. And so I'm thinking, well, this is an easy one. You know, I said, well, one of the things I looked at is like the scripture references that you that you've used. I noticed mm -hmm. that from this, you know, this Jewish, whatever, whatever. And um, and I was like, and but you have to pay to cite that. Uh, oh, that, wow. That and so she's like, oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> wow. And I'm kind of like, well, yes, you do. <laughs> like, it is my job to know that. <laughs> if you don't, then I will be the one that they can come after. Um, yeah. So I was like, I said, well, do you, you know, she's just like adamant. No, you don't. You know, I've known people that use, I said, well, I don't know their situation. I said, well, do you have the Bible in front of you? And she's, you know, I can hear her shuffling around as she went to grab the Bible. And I said, well, go to their copyright page and open the copyright page. I said, and somewhere in the middle of that page, it should say something about fair use. Yeah. And, you know, what you need to do in order to quote from this mm -hmm. particular manuscript. And right. I can hear her kind of reading along and then she gets to the point where, yeah, you have to pay and get wow. approval to use that. And then she's like, oh, oh, I didn't know that. I was like, well, that's not your job to know. That's my job right. to know that. Exactly. So let me be the publisher right. and you be the yes. writer and we'll work together to make sure we both don't get sued. <laughs> Like, yeah. so, so that's a good a good point and i wrote it down yeah. while you were saying it is say you if you are paying a publisher or in your case you know you got signed by a publisher and in my case if you paid me to be your publisher then listen yes. <laughs> like you said it's our job exactly. to keep you out of trouble and keep ourselves out of trouble exactly. and you know I run into that sometimes where you get that pushback from an author and it's like um I'm, I'm, I have your best interest at heart and ultimately <laughs> my publishing company is tied to your work so right. listen yes. listen Linda, listen <laughs> Yep. So yeah, that's a great a great <laughs> point to end on. Listen to your publisher. Listen to your publisher, people. That's yeah. like that's all you need to know. It's like no. <laughs> Listen to your publisher. <laughs> but Kelly, can, can I just share uh, what I consider like publishing bloopers? I just have two. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's just real two quick ones, and this goes back to not cutting corners. Because mm. as you know, as a publisher, a lot of one of the main questions I always get from people is, hey, I have this book. How much is it going to cost? And there are a lot of things that 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 cost is based on. It's called it is based on the number of pages It's based on the size of the book It's based on, you know, hard covers versus soft cover. There are a lot of things that go a lot of variables that go into the cost of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have seen books where you know and then as a publisher a lot of times people say hey um i know your publisher can you work with me i've already worked on this book or whatever so they'll come to the meeting and they'll bring copies of books that they may have published you know have published before and i have i kid you not i've seen books that's probably and i'm trying to do dimensions with my hand but you probably can't really tell but i've seen books that were probably say about a three by five mm. <laughs> size book with about 14 point font on the pages and the pages could be probably about maybe 50 pages. Mm -hmm. So three by five, 50 pages with 14 point font. That's a pamphlet. <laughs> that is not a book. And if somebody <laughs> tries to publish that for you, take a step back <laughs> and don't let them do that to you. <laughs> don't, let right. them, don't let them do that to you. But then on the flip side, I've seen, uh, you know, another person I met with, they had a book and it was published and it was, you know, a normal size book. It was pretty, you know, pretty thick in pages. And there, it was like single space, maybe a 10 point font. Oh, I mean, wow. when I say oh. the writing was so little and so cramped together, and then the margins were almost non-existent that you can't, like when you open the book, it's like the words are up against the margin. Wow. But again, probably trying to call uh, cut costs because to mm -hmm. actually do like regular size with regular margins and regular spacing, you're going to push past your, you know, your, your page count. Right. So, you know, so in order to trying to cut costs, it's like, well, take away the spaces, take away the margin. Let's no. make it smaller. Don't do that to yourself. That is a poorly no. produced product. 
So I yeah. call I like to call those publishing bloopers um, that yeah. I have literally in real life seen have sat down with people who would say, "Hey, I've been published before. I'm a published author, and here's a book that I published." And I'm looking at this, and it's like, "Who did that to you? Why did you yeah. let us?" <laughs> yeah. Well, fifty. Don't 50 show that to anybody pages. else. Well, fifty blank pages in the back, and I heard like Ingram Spark is starting to really cut kick down on that. Like you yeah. can't like you know try to boost your book up. Exactly. say it's 200 pages I have in the last 50 be blank pages or something That's crazy like that. And so yeah. the very last thing I'll say too is that you need to pay attention to, I know, because we, we got to go, but um, but is the pricing, the pricing of a book. So I, I've seen, um, just recently I saw, you know, somebody whose ebook was like $24.99. Wow. You're still like, yeah. That's ambitious. <laughs> Who buying that? I don't know. Um, oh. You know, and I and I really was like, wow. Like, I wonder how you how that person is going to do. And then, and of course, I went and said, who was the publisher? Was like, the publisher, who did you right. that? Um, because ultimately, like right now, when you say like for like for them, I mean, like twenty. I mean, fifteen dollars is kind of pushing it. You know, if you, you know, got a Michelle Obama kind of book, like 24, 25 right. for the hardcover, um, you know, is good. But if you're somebody that's like a new publisher that's coming out of the gate, your your book should not, I, in my opinion, should not be priced over 20 or 20, no. Like, a, especially not as an ebook. Yeah. That's, so, that's really ambitious for ebook. Yeah. So if you want somebody to buy your product, you know, don't look at it and say, oh, I'm going to price it at this so I can keep this much profit right. um, because who's going to buy your book? And, you know, and people are really looking at where they spend their dollars. And I'm very particular about what I now I, I did just recently spend, I think, twenty four dollars. I actually ended up getting it on a credit after the fact. But um, Alicia Keys new book. Okay. Um, this, okay. But she had cameos in there from Michelle Obama, Oprah. Um, she had all these people that did cameos on her audio. And the book was oh, wow. really, really, yeah, they came in and they actually spoke. And her husband, um, and it was really, really well done. I paid $24 for that and I didn't feel like I got robbed. But right. certainly I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm paying $24, $25 for somebody's ebook. Exactly. So just and I think to the point, you know, I didn't know we we're, you know, going to get into pricing and stuff, but I no. think you know, I think it's an important thing to talk about as well. And I never forget um, one of the things I always talk to, you know, uh, aspiring writers about because you know, cost is you know obviously one of those things that they're always like, well, how much is it going to cost me? And I always mm -hmm. think about like in the music industry where they talk about you know this cost, this cost, this cost. Like as we're going through this process you're racking up an invoice of different yeah. expenses, right? Yeah. And so if I put an option in front of you, hardcover or soft cover, and you say, oh, I want the hardcover. Okay, ching, 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 that's going to cost more. Um, your exactly. Yeah. And I'll tell you, under my, we I only have one hardcover published book, and it's a book of prayer. And the only reason that I did it hardcover is because it's a book that I imagine, you know, people, when they purchase it, they'll open it up often. And I didn't yeah. want it to get flimsy and all that stuff. So that was the only reason that we made that investment. But that yeah. book wasn't as um, dense as a lot of the other books, you know, on, on our um, our list. So it mm -hmm. was easy to kind of make that, um, make that provision for that. Um, but right. even with my last book, you know, I remember trying to consider that I want to do hardcover versus soft cover, and mm -hmm. even for the printing of it, which you know mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, exactly, you're talking about printing. Um, it was almost double the cost. You know, mm -hmm. I would even have to get half the books or pay twice as much <laughs> for the same right. number of books to get it yeah. in hard copy. And so when you're when you're doing it in hard copy, one, you're um, you're spending a lot more money to produce it which means that you have to sell it for more. And I imagine, yeah. you know, Alicia Key's case, uh, one, she has probably a huge publisher behind her where she right. didn't have to come out of her pocket right. for anything. Right. And they probably right. were pumping right. a whole bunch of money into the project alone, right. you know, yeah, because- it's Oprah's, it's Oprah's uh, imprint. 
Exactly. A new, a new publishing imprint and she exactly. published other cheese. So yeah, so she don't have those issues that you know some of us exactly. you know, have to worry about as far as a cost perspective. But but yeah, you're you're right. Like you really have to take all those things into consideration. Right. And especially when you're talking about doing hard covers that some people just like don't get it. It's like you do that, it costs so much to print it and you're getting like maybe 10 cents on a book. <laughs> it's like Yep. It's crazy. You I, know, never get, you I never forget how, uh, well, how it was it? Lisa Left Eye Lopez. I never forget an interview she did. She's like, they were like, well, how'd you guys go bankrupt? She's like, let me tell you. You know, she just kind of right. breaks it down. <laughs> you get three pennies for every record. So, you know, she just oh, broke yeah. it down. And it was like, yeah. facts. Like, that is so, that's exactly how it grew. Um, yeah. So, people think, you know, you're going to get in this thing and you're going to become a billionaire. You know, you yeah. wrote the bestseller and you're going to become a billionaire. I'll probably become a billionaire before you do as your publisher, just being honest. But yeah. we're gonna make some money off of it, you know. But the right. point is, you're not gonna get in. You're not gonna get into publishing to become a billionaire. You're not gonna become a writer to become a billionaire unless you parlay that writing into other things, film, exactly. all that stuff. Yeah. So you know, really augmenting again, and it all points back to your product because if you're mm -hmm. writing about something and your book is not, you know, well written. If it's not, um, if you're not well versed in what it is that you're writing, but then you're trying yeah. to parlay this writer thing into a speaker thing, and then you know that is like affecting your entire brand. So brand. you know, yeah. you know so, right? <laughs> yeah, people have to be. They, they have to trust you as a writer. Yeah, you know. And so if you put out, you know, especially with that first product. I mean, you know, everybody, you, we had that trial and error period, but, you know, you want people to feel good about what they're spending their money on. And if the exactly. first, you know, if you're producing, don't get known for producing. So I always try to look for a better word, but the word I was going to say is garbage. <laughs> okay, it's time to go. <laughs> I think what I used, I described my book earlier. I said it was, it was tragic. I said, how did I describe my book earlier when I talked about, it um, I said it was tragic. So don't create, don't create any tragedies. Don't create tragic work, right. right. No tragedies, no tragedies. Because yeah. you want people to continue to support you when you come exactly. with, um, you know, uh, additional projects behind that one. Exactly. All right. So, man, we still had like 22 people hanging out with us. That's really cool. Oh, awesome. And I'll tell you, I mean, people probably don't know, and I don't know, but this is probably a good, I'd say good, you know, we've been on a, going here for about an hour and a half. I don't know yeah. about you, but this, this is a couple of hundred dollars worth of uh, information, <laughs> valuable information. Right? <laughs> so hopefully people were taking notes. <laughs> that is so true. But um, but I've enjoyed it, you know, and I, yeah. I don't mind doing things like this from time to time. Um, and I hope that people found value, you know, yes. found, found value in the things that we've shared and that it's helpful to them um, as they move for, for, forward in their writing journey. Um, thank you, wonderful ladies. I appreciated this. You're welcome. Oh. Um, just a comment, so. But thank you, Kwanzaa. Thank you, Ms. Kimberly. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Oh, always a pleasure. Time with you, um, and 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 here's other a, a, just another small piece, real quick, is about the collaboration piece. Like I love that you know you said, hey, we should jump on, we should collaborate on something, you know. And neither one of us is intimidated because the other one is a publisher. Like sometimes you can just exactly. come together in order to provide value to your community, my community. And so I thank you for that. Like I thank really, you. really thank you for that. Thank you. It's That's always awesome. a pleasure. Yeah. So, so again, um, we've been listening to Kwanzaa Gibson, and she is the um, founder of First Fruits Publishing. <laughs> you can find her right here on Facebook. And I am Kimberly K. Labou, and I am the founder of Labou Publishing Enterprise. And so thank you guys for hanging out with us uh, for way you. longer than we intended. But I hope you found value in what we shared this evening. So take care and be blessed, everyone. And have a great night. Stay safe. <laughs>